Good evening and welcome to the last in a very special lecture series. My name is Paige Engelbrexen and with me off screen are my coworkers Winter Gary and Caitlin Williams. Winter and I work for the Highlands Biological Foundation, which supports natural history research and education in the Southern Appalachians. A key topic for both of these areas is climate change. In order to address this topic more directly, we are broadening our program to include this new lecture series. For the last three weeks, we have been inviting field researchers who have worked in the region to share their findings and related research and what it suggests for how climate change has been, is, or may impact our area. Throughout this presentation, please feel free to leave comments and questions in the chat and Q&A. After the presentation, Winter and I will be moderating a Q&A section for the remainder of our time together. While I don't expect that it will be an issue, I do want to say upfront that as an organization that supports science, we believe the science. Climate change is a reality. We are not here to debate this. Instead, the questions before us are what impacts will it have and how can we mitigate it? Our book club this past year addressed the second question and this series aims to begin answering the first. As part of that, please join me in welcoming Dr. Jason Fridley and Jordan Stark to the webinar. Jason Fridley is a professor of biology at Syracuse University. He received his PhD from UNC Chapel Hill and started research in the Smokies as a National Parks Ecological Research Fellow in 2004. Other aspects of his research program involve the biology of invasive species, particularly that of forest understory shrubs. Jordan Stark is a graduate student in Dr. Fridley's lab studying microclimates in the Smokies. She uses sensors and models to understand the factors that lead to small scale variation in climate and the effects of this variation on plant communities. Dr. Jason Fridley, Jordan, welcome. Paige, thank you very much. Uh, it's really a delight. Can everybody hear me? Excellent. Um, it's a delight to be able to speak to you all. I'm really glad you're interested in these um, these topics that, that Jordan and I have been working on. I'm going to try to share my screen. Uh, let's see here. And all right. Can everybody see that okay? Paige, give me a thumb. Oh, I got a thumbs up from Winter. Great. All right. So, um, so we work in Great Smoky Mountains National Park, and sadly, I have never been to Highlands, but it's been on my bucket list for a very long time. I wish I could do this in person there, so maybe maybe soon enough. But um, as Paige said, a, a lot of what goes on in the Southern Appalachians is, uh, has been fascinating to people like me for a very long time, uh, originally not for climate change concerns, of course, but because of the fantastically complex vegetation of the Southern Appalachian that is quite unique in North America and to some extent around the world. And I'm showing you here a uh, one of the first real uh, investigations of why vegetation is so cool in the Southern Appalachians by a person named Robert Whitaker, uh, who was uh, one of the foundational ecologists of the 20th century. He actually uh, did his postgraduate work down in the Smokies and he walked all over the place and he counted the uh, types of uh, trees and shrubs and herbs all over uh, the, the Smokies and came to the conclusion that, uh, you know, for a very long time, actually since Alexander von Humboldt for hundreds of years, we've known about the influence of a factor like elevation or altitude on why plants that like cold environments are distributed up high and plants that like warm environments are distributed at low elevations. Um, but Whitaker was one of the first to demonstrate that in fact, there's just as much interesting variation going on in plant communities in another axis that we call the kind of exposure axis. And that's the axis that connects what goes on in the lowland, the area near the cove forest near the stream to just a couple hundred meters away to the ridge tops where you get a distinctly different vegetation. And in the Smokies, like other places of the Southern Appalachians, in fact, the plants and animals turn over several times if you were to walk on a trail from a stream side to the adjacent ridge side. And so for the last 60 plus years, plant ecologists and people that study vegetation have tried to understand what are the environmental factors that actually drive this difference in composition between what goes on near streams and what goes on by the ridges? So uh, Jordan and I are going to talk to you a lot about this exposure axis. 
And so we think about on one side, you've got what we call cove forests, these incredibly rich, diverse uh, places, often with some of the largest trees uh, in Eastern North America, uh, up to a more uh, xeric or dry oak hickory and often even pine forests that line the ridges. Um, and up until recently, it's it technologically, it was very difficult to understand the environmental factors that were associated with that. Um, so what we're gonna do is describe to you a couple of projects where we've been putting out uh, fairly cheap environmental sensors together with a statistical modeling framework. And don't worry, we won't get really into the statistics at all, um, but talk to you about how we go about trying to understand how both the landscape, because it's incredibly complex, um, the highly dissected topography, and the plant communities themselves, including this incredible forest cover of 100 plus feet high, uh, modify the, the, essentially the climates and the environment that plants and animals live in. Uh, so there's a lot of things that, that happen from when you go from a stream side to an adjacent ridge, but we're gonna concentrate really on the climate. So essentially the temperature and moisture regimes that plants and animals experience. Um, so when I started this project uh, almost 20 years ago, um, I had to do a lot of reading up on the biophysics of this process and I am by no means a, a physicist, but a lot of the main factors uh, that we use in our models uh, and we use to deploy our sensor networks are pretty easy to understand. So uh, if you were to try to understand any particular place you're walking in a trail in the Southern Appalachians, why it might be relatively cool or relatively warm, there's only a couple of main factors you have to think about. So the first one is obviously, as you walk up the trail to high elevation, the atmosphere thins out and it gets cooler. That's called adiabatic cooling, just has to do with essentially the density of air and how it, it gets less dense as you move to high elevations. So we have this elevation factor that's, that's obvious to anyone that hangs out in the mountains. Another obvious one is uh, if you spend more time uh, getting warmed by the sun, you're gonna be hotter. And it's not just the fact that you're actually getting photons right now from the sun, but it's the fact that Areas that have, for example, a southwestern aspect will actually absorb radiation and store it in various ways. It'll store it in water, it'll store it in rocks, it'll store it in soil, it'll store it in the trees. And so there's this kind of long-term heating effect of areas that are more exposed to the sun. Um, and it's not just uh, the angle of the of the slope that you're on, as as you well know, hanging out in the Southern Appalachians, oftentimes you're actually shaded by adjacent ridges. So it's called hill shade. And of course, having a dense plant canopy above you makes all the difference when it comes to shading effects. So there's elevation, there's radiation, there's a, a soil moisture itself plays a really strong role in thermal budgets near the ground. So essentially, for a place to really warm up, it often has to dry out because water has such an incredible, incredible capacity for storing heat. Uh, and then finally, the thing that you may not think that much about because you may not hang out in the woods a lot at night um, is a fundamentally different aspect of minimum temperatures is what's called cold air drainage. And the way it's been described to me is that cold air moves like syrup. It's much denser and in the evening, air tends to move down slopes. During the daytime, it moves up slopes, but in the evening, it moves down. And even, you know, rocks, trees, uh, different depressions in the landscape can actually create cold air dams that literally cold air just gets stopped and will cause little depressions of, of, uh, of fairly extreme minimum temperatures, even in not much topography. So when we think about what effect the landscape has on temperatures at ground level that a salamander might care about or a, a trillium might care about. You have to consider really these four main factors. Um, and, you know, we are far from the first people to study this. Uh, in the mid 20th century, research on what's called microclimatology really took off, uh, particularly in Europe. And there's this is actually one of my favorite books of all time. It's called The Climate Near the Ground by Rudolf Geiger. It's been through many editions 
uh, even editions put out after he died. Um, and uh, he's got some incredible data sets in this book um, that talk about the difference of, for example, peach trees that are just a meter below where the frost line um, occurs, having no edible fruits at the bottom of the slope and completely untouched at the top of the slope of a distance of less than, you know, here to the ceiling of my room. Uh, there's other studies of, of uh, frost effects on trees and hurting trees in topography that you couldn't even see with the naked eye. I just want to point out, this is a map of where uh, fir trees have been damaged by frost. These contour lines are, are 10 centimeter intervals. Uh, so, you know, I'm not sure how much of this stuff I believe, but uh, there's incredible work on the effect of landscapes on climates that plants and animals and humans experience. So when uh, I got into this work, my objective was to looking through the perspective of plants to try to understand and model the microclimates that are experienced, not just across elevations, which is kind of the obvious pattern, but across these uh, different aspects of topography. So the idea is kind of mapping temperature regimes in the daytime and the nighttime, because there's different factors, um, and then across different seasons. And so the questions that were addressed initially is kind of just real basic descriptive questions. What's the extent of temperature variation at the ground level across a place like the Smokies? Um, what are the factors that are most associated with variation in these microclimates? Um, and then where we want to go and what Jordan's gonna concentrate on uh, in a little bit is what does it mean uh, that you can warm the atmosphere, which is in many ways disconnected by what goes on below the canopy, what are the connections between atmospheric warming and global climate change on the microclimates that plants and animals will experience in the future? And how can we use that information to predict the effects of climate change on plant and animal communities uh, in the Smokies? All right, so here's the, the fun part. So this was all just an excuse to hike uh, hundreds of miles around the park. Um, this is 20 years ago, so the technology at the time, which actually was pretty revolutionary, is these, uh, these small sensors I'm showing here, which is about the size of a, a couple of stacked nickels. They're called eye buttons. You can still buy them. They're actually used by the refrigeration industry as a, a really rugged way to like, if a tuna is caught in the middle of the ocean, you can actually stick an eye button in the middle of it. And by the time it gets to where it needs to be uh, sent for storage and then selling, you can check its temperatures the whole way. But they're really great to use in an outdoor environment because they're almost indestructible. And most importantly, bears don't seem to find them. Everything else we've put out, and believe me, and Jordan could talk to you for days on this subject, is completely destroyed by bears. They can smell essentially everything. They can dig up anything they want. They can climb wherever they want to in the canopy. Um, but these things are so small that um, occasionally they're used as chewing gum uh, and squirrels will chew on them or something. But for the most part, we put them out and they stay there. And the great thing about these things is they have a little tiny battery. They're completely self-contained. You can program them by setting, just taking your laptop in the field having it record temperature every two hours, and then come back a year later and you've got a continuous record of temperatures. They're also cheap. They were about 20 bucks at the time. Uh, we've moved away from this. And uh, if people have questions about how we're monitoring moisture and other things now, we actually build custom sensors, but, but these really revolutionized the way we could explore uh, microclimate uh, back. And, and they're still very widely used by ecologists. So I'll show you a map, but essentially you're going to see a uh, hundred plus of these things distributed throughout the Smokies. They're stuck on trees using cheap PVC to protect them. Uh, and they essentially record temperature every two hours. Here's where we decided to work. Um, every little blue dot. Oh, by the way, if you don't know, this is Great Smoky Mountains National Park. It's uh, 2000 square kilometers of some of the most gorgeous mountain landscapes in the world. Uh, the central massif here has almost the highest elevations in the eastern United States, um, just uh, 10 or 20 meters uh, lower than um, 
uh, Mount Mitchell over on the other side of Asheville. Um, so Klingman's Dome would be located about here and there's Mount LeConte and, and you can see the spine of course is the border of North Carolina and Tennessee. Uh, we decided to focus on uh, two specific watersheds right in the central part of the park. So uh, this is the area, here's Gatlinburg. So this is the area that gets a lot of visitation. Uh, it's easy to get around in because Highway 441 goes right through there. Another part of the park that very few people see that's looking south from Klingman's Dome, it's called the Nolan Creek Watershed. And there's a, a road that actually goes to the bottom and a road that goes to the top. But the rest of this is, is, is pretty much wilderness. But there are, of course, great trails. Um, and then the other points that you see here on the map are uh, essentially along roads or in Cades Cove and other things that were easy, ac easily accessible for validation purposes. So what we did was we put out these sensors, we created models of how the landscape modifies climate to create microclimate. We made predictions and then using the circles that are not in the squares, we asked how good is the model? Is it worth doing all this hiking and beautiful uh, terrain to actually create models like this? Um, and I'm not going to go into the modeling details, but the way that we, we model in ecology is, um, is hierarchically. So we, we don't just randomly throw sensors on the landscape. We divide up the landscape into elements that we think are important in driving a certain process. So in this case, because of the reasons I showed you before, we're really interested in, for example, the distance of these loggers from streams. And we're also interested in capturing, uh, say, uh, a high solar incidence on one slope versus so a south facing slope versus a north facing slope. So we divided up the landscape into these essentially 10 logger transects. Um, and to give you a scale, this is about 500 meters or so. Um, and so they started at the stream side and they would go up slope off into the adjacent ridge. Okay. So essentially you hike on a trail and then you start bushwhacking your way back into some really exciting uh, territory, usually without bears, actually with more boars than bears, but um, I wish I were still doing it today, but instead people like Jordan get to do it. Um, we age out of this, uh, sadly. Um, so let me just show you a, just um, a couple of graphs to give you an idea of the scale of variation. Uh, and I'll, I'll show you in, in summer and winter and daytime and nighttime, because they actually are pretty distinct patterns. So I'll, I'll show you a couple of graphs that look like this. And each one of these boxes is one of those transects. So it's about 10 loggers. Sometimes it's not very many. Sometimes it's a little more. Uh, but this is just kind of distilling the information of the difference in minimum temperatures on the y-axis as a function of whether or not you're right on the stream, which would be about zero, versus the adjacent ridge, which is be beyond about six or so. And so you can see here that there's, with some variance, for the most part, as you get closer to the stream, uh, you are about two degrees Celsius or about four degrees Fahrenheit cooler than you would be if you were standing at a similar elevation but on a ridge side. Okay, so uh, in the, the heat of the summer, you're cooler standing next to a stream. That's not going to shock anybody, but getting the idea of how much cooler is what we were after there. There's an even bigger difference associated with radiation. So it's a similar graph here, the same transects. The X values now are how much, uh, essentially how much radiation does a particular spot have on the landscape. So the difference between a north facing slope and a south facing slope. And the difference there is actually enormous. It's four degrees Celsius or about eight degrees Fahrenheit, which in the summertime is roughly equivalent to about half of the latitudes in the contiguous US. So something like St. Louis to New Orleans is about four degrees C difference on average uh, in the summertime. And here we see that within the span of a couple hundred meters. So it's extreme microclimate variance. Um, Again, I won't go into the modeling details, but we create these hierarchical models based on these different environmental factors. We can model what goes on in a given day based on weather station data. We can use that then to create 
models of how elevation, stream distance, radiation, and other proxies for things like moisture um, can affect uh, minimum and maximum temperatures. And then we again make predictions and we validate the model with the set of about 50 loggers. And then we can create a model that for any given time at any given place in the park can predict a temperature. Uh, we, we generally don't try to do that in an hourly time step. We do it day by day, but this gives you a sense of what these models looks like. So here's how cold it gets in the Smokies um, based on that model. And here's how warm it gets on the Smokies based on that model. And you'll notice that the warm model is a little more pixelated than the cold model. Uh, and the warm model is really showing these very strong localized effects of cooling by the streams and warming by the sun. And if I were to kind of drill down on what this looks like um, using some not so sophisticated software of 15 years ago, you could do a much better job of this now, but this is just draping those model predictions on a, a 3D map. And this just gives you a sense of the, the red from 28C down to the blue of 13 degrees C in July. There's really extreme variation in how warm it is in the daytime in July based on uh, are you in a cove or are you on a ridge? In which way is your ridge pointing? A less extreme variance with cold, but still you've got a, a topographic effect here of, of stream conditions, for example, ameliorating extreme cold in January. And I showed you that initial slide of how we think about vegetation differences in the Smokies based on elevation and this exposure axis from coves to ridges. We can plot the same information using the climate data from coastal ridges. And so here, this shows you the interaction of uh, elevation and stream distance on minimum January temperatures, which under a forest are warmer than weather station data because the canopy has a warming effect for extreme cold temperatures. And here's July maximum temperatures, which have again, this extreme difference based on how much sun you're getting or how far you are from streams. And of course, a forest canopy like this, as thick as you have in the Smokies means that uh, weather station data don't even really give you a clue as to what the, the weather is under a forest canopy because it's so much cooler and there are so large effects of uh, topography. And I'll just skip through this. These are ways of transforming temperature data into things that organisms care about, like uh, how fast it gets warm um, and things like how, how often frosts occur. Um, so what we're gonna do now is, so I've just covered just very briefly on how we go about field techniques and modeling techniques to create microclimate models that we can test um, with other sensors. I'm gonna transition here to Jordan in a second, who's gonna tell you what that means for for how organisms will experience climate change in the park. But I wanted to show you the work by a postdoc of mine, Mark Lesser, who collected all this weather station data for the last 100 years plus in the Smokies. And we looked at trends of all these different climate variables. Um, and we can use this information to make predictions about the future. Um, and I just wanna point out uh, that first of all, uh, the Southern Appalachians so far have been more or less buffered from a lot of the warming that has happened elsewhere in Eastern North America. You may have heard, and I'm probably true of Highlands to some extent as well, is there's a little bit of a, a, a warming hole is what it's called for the Southern Appalachians. It's a little controversial for why the Southern Appalachians have not warmed to the same extent as other areas in Eastern North America. But here is just the temperature trajectories of the last 100 years, and they're all over the place. Uh, and they do not have a regular upward trend. However, things like precipitation, which is down here, TAP, actually do have, it, it, it wiggles, but there's actually about, it's about 10% wetter in the Smokies today than it was 100 years ago. And I have some interesting thoughts for why that might be that I'm happy to answer in the questions. Um, but so now I'm gonna um, introduce uh, Jordan Stark who's a, a, a graduate student in my lab who's been working in the Smokies for the last couple of years. And she's done a really interesting new analysis on future microclimates in the park and what that might mean for some of the plant species there. 
Thanks, Jason. Um, yeah, so I'm going to talk a little bit about um, comparing the microclimate model that um, Jason's been describing to um, sort of general uh, predictions like we might get from weather stations and, and using those two different kinds of predictions about climate to think about um, changes in the plant communities in the future. So uh, in the top of this figure here, you can see um, basically a, a projection of that microclimate model that, that we've been discussing um, over the period from 1970 to 2000. So um, because we have all of this amazing weather station data, um, we can summarize this model in lots of different ways. And um, so, so that can be really comparable with other data sets that other researchers use to think about climate and plants. And one of those is that second figure that you see on the screen um, that says macroclimate models. So that's just um, a data set that you can download online. And so it's predicting what's the climate in these one kilometer squares. So that's why it looks really pixelated. Those are actually the one kilometer squares. And you can imagine that because so much of the climate variation is related to um, these small scale gradients that we get a huge amount of variation within those one kilometer squares. And so basically we're looking to see um, how these two models would predict different um, things about the plant community and the future climate. Um, so here, um, one thing to think about is that, that some of the parts of the park um, are more tightly coupled to the general atmosphere. So those uh, sort of warmer, drier places along ridges and at low elevations, um, as the climate warms, are likely to warm also, because there is less um, sort of tree canopy, there's less cloud cover that's sort of protecting them um, from the atmosphere. And so here you can see that um, we simulated four degrees of sort of regional warming. And in the low elevation ridges, we think those places will warm about four degrees. But there are places that are near streams and up at the higher elevations that if the conditions that are leading to uh, microclimate um, variation today continue into the future will be protected in some, to some extent. They all still warm, um, but here the highest elevation places warm about half as much as um, the low elevation ridges. So they may be somewhat protected. We can use these, uh, put these uh, predictions back on those same axes that you were looking at before that go back to this early work of Whitaker, um, where we're thinking about elevation and exposure and how those are, are related to climate. So on the left side, you can see that the macroclimate model, the weather station model, it's basically just about elevation, right? The lowest elevation places are warmest and the highest elevation places are coolest. But on the right side with a microclimate model, we get sort of a diagonal pattern. So um, places that are near streams are cooler than you would expect based on just their elevation. For the warming, um, macroclimate models just predict even warming at this scale. Um, they can't distinguish um, different, different places at, at a really fine scale. And so we predict four degrees of warming across the whole park. Um, but in the microclimate model, we again see that same diagonal pattern of um, less warming at high elevations and near streams. Um, so we can use these models uh, and maps of climate to uh, predict which places are suitable for different kinds of plant species. Um, so we're using here uh, an amazing database of like tons of records of plants that people have gone out and measured from lots of different labs, um, lots of different researchers that work in the Smokies, um, have measured tons of different vegetation plots. And we pull out individual species from those and say, where do those species grow? Do they grow uh, in places that are warmer or cooler? Do they grow um, uh, in places that are sort of down in coves or up on ridges? And we can make predictions from both the macroclimate model and the microclimate model to compare. So here I'm showing just one species, the tulip poplar, um, which many of you might know. 
Um, and you can see that in general, the predictions of the macroclimate model and the microclimate model about which areas the tulip poplar is growing in today are really similar. And that's good, right? Because we know where the tulip poplar is growing today. Um, but you can also see some differences. So um, there's, you know, these sort of pixels again in the macroclimate model where um, the, the weather station data just can't tell us anything about how different the climate is within those squares, whereas the microclimate model can. Um, and if we summarize this over all the species that we can model in the park, and put them back on those um, elevation and exposure axes, we see really different patterns when we start to think about the future. So um, in the macro, according to the macroclimate model, um, here the sort of yellow is um, more change in the, in the kinds of species in a place, um, less stable habitat, and darker green means that more species that are currently living in a place will be able to live there with four degrees of warming. So in the macroclimate model, um, particularly at high elevations, a huge number of species are sort of outside the window of climates that they like to live in. But in the microclimate model, we get more stability, especially at mid elevations and near streams. And we think that might be, and that's, that's interesting because um, if you remember the warming figure, the, the least warming happens at the highest elevations. So it's sort of odd that that's not where we would see the most stability. Um, but the species that live, we think that may be because the species that live at those really high elevations like spruce and fir um, are also pretty sensitive to environmental changes. They have a really narrow window of climates that they can grow in. Uh, while the species that are at mid elevation uh, may be able to take advantage of the slower warming by um, having a wider climate, um, wider range of climates that they inhabit. And when we predict this back out onto maps, you can see that the, the actual on the ground predictions are very different between the macroclimate and the microclimate model. So here again is the tulip poplar, but this is its future suitability with climate change, with warming. And in the macroclimate model, we only see tulip poplar um, stable habitat uh, sort of at the mid elevations and some sort of along ridges, where in the microclimate model, it's along streams, even at the lower elevations, it can still be um, stable. Um, however, we don't really know which of these is a better model because we, we can't, we don't have any data to test that, right? We, we can't um, see the future of these trees. And so, um, uh, that the statistics tell us that these two models are similarly good. And so it's um, likely that, that some species respond more to particular climate aspects than others, and, and we're not sure which, which are a better prediction at this point. Um, if species do respond to those microclimate conditions, there are all these places across the park represented here as darker blue places that are what we could call cryptic refugia, uh, places where uh, the habitat of the species that live there now might be stable in the future if they're responding to microclimate. But if they're responding to macroclimate, that habitat won't be stable. And so um, this is a really interesting way to think about, you know, what areas of the park might be most sensitive to climate change. Often we worry a lot about those high elevation species and high elevation areas, and that might be right, but it's also um, worth thinking about those low elevation ridges that are much more exposed to those atmospheric changes. Um, so to sum that up, um, the, the main things that we sort of know from this work is that the macroclimate models are not great for the Smokies. There's so much variation at that really small scale that we could get the predictions about climate really wrong if we're not thinking about the small scale. And we know that those low elevation ridges are most tightly tied to what's going on with the atmosphere. And this means that microclimate buffering might allow some of those mid elevation species um, to persist even with some amount of climate change. Um, as is, is typical in a science presentation, we have to end with, there's lots of things we don't know. Um, we don't know whether um, some species are more sensitive to these microclimate conditions than others. You could imagine, right, that there's like a, 
a little forest understory species that spends its entire growing cycle under the forest canopy in that protected buffered microclimate. Whereas canopy species, once they get their leaves up above the canopy are really experiencing a very different um, climate condition. Uh, we also know that moisture is important, but we don't really have a lot of data about how um, soil moisture and other, you know, sort of wetness um, factors uh, play into the distribution of species. And I, that's uh, the other project that I'm working on. I've currently got a whole bunch of data loggers out in the Smokies measuring soil moisture. So hopefully we'll have some information about that soon. And finally, we don't know whether the factors that are leading to these variations in climate at small scales are going to continue in the future. So if there are disturbances to the canopy that's protecting the um, climate near the ground, um, that could lead to really dramatic changes in, in the temperature experienced by lots of these species. And that's all I've got. I don't know if there's anything else you wanted to add or if we should take questions. We're happy to open it up for questions. Thanks, Jordan. And I just want to thank, um, in particular, the National Park Service. That's been a, just an incredible partner over the last 20 years in various ways to facilitate our, our work in this incredible outdoor laboratory. Wonderful. Well, thank you both very much. That was a fascinating presentation. And I, I kind of want to be selfish and kick things off because I noticed when you were talking about the the temperature in the Smokies and this warming hole you mentioned in the southern Appalachians I'm not aware right off the top of my head of any historical trends for highlands plateau that are scientific but I have talked with folks who will tell me about oh, there used to be an ice house near one of the big lakes and it used to freeze deep enough for everybody to go skating on and they'd actually cut ice out to cool their food in the summer. And I have only ever seen the lakes barely ice over. So just from that cultural perspective, it seems that at least on the plateau, there has been some significant changes if their memory is holding up correctly. Yeah, and I, I you know, I should, the, the caveat is that we actually do have, for, for some aspects of climate over the last century, there is a pretty strong signal, even in the Smokies. So for example, spring temperatures are far warmer now than they have been historically. And that seems to be kind of a regular increase. Um, so as with, as with everything um, in such a complex landscape, it, it kind of depends on what factor you want to pull out. And as to what we have thousands of organisms that we care about in the Southern Appalachians, and they're all probably to some extent care about different things. And so one of the huge challenges is not only trying to understand their climates that they live in, which for a salamander is a you know, very tiny area of the landscape, but what about their climate regime actually affects their reproduction, their ability to move to other places, their ability to get the food and energy they need, et cetera. So it's it's kind of a double whammy of unknowns. There's a biophysical part and there's a biological part. And I really love how you're, you're uh, perhaps inadvertently tying together the previous two lectures we've had where we had somebody speaking about the effects of climate change on neotropical migrants and talking about that the distance between when the food is available and when the chicks need it. Um, and also last week we had somebody speaking about salamanders and, and that very tight link to surface uh, factors and when they were active. So thank you for that. Mm -hmm. um, and Bill Horton has a fantastic question. He is asking do lo historical local temperature records correlate to macro forest changes like the chestnut blight or massive logging impacts in the area, say in 1890 to 1920 or so? That's a spectacular question and it uh relates to what I was hinting about uh, earlier. Uh, it, and so I'll, I'll take this first and Jordan can pipe in if she wants to. So um, the short answer is there is some circumstantial evidence that widespread logging, which um, for people that don't know, before the Great Smoky Mountains became a national park right in the mid 1930s, there was kind of a race to cut down as many trees as the loggers could before it was under protection. And about a third of the park is what we would consider old growth forest that actually wasn't logged um, commercially. 
Um, but boy, a huge proportion of it uh, was really cut down. And so, uh, and it was both slash and burn. So a lot of it then burned uh, right around the time it was becoming a park and right around the time that chestnut blight was becoming a pervasive issue that would eventually in the decades to come essentially remove every large chestnut from the Smokies and Southern Appalachians. Um, the, one of the really interesting angles of that is that uh, what happens above a plant canopy has a lot to do with what the plants are doing in that plant canopy. And as, as many of you know, uh, the Smokies are called the Smokies for a really interesting reason, is this really bizarre kind of haze, uh, mist, a uh, wisp of, of what seems like um, kind of fog or smoke that often happens uh, right around the, the canopy level. And a lot of that has to do with how plants use water. And so a substantial proportion of the rain that falls, uh, the plants actually themselves put back in the atmosphere through photosynthesis. So they pull in carbon and they lose water. There's really interesting evidence through more recent disturbances. So some of you may know a portion of the uh, Gatlinburg area and south of there burned uh, about five years ago, four years ago. And there's some evidence that the loss of the canopy downslope influenced uh, kind of some aspects of rainfall, particularly fine particulate rainfall upslope from the forest. There's a, a woman that we collaborate with um, who's acknowledged on the slide I just showed, Anna Barros, who's a climatologist who actually studies how tree canopies create rain. Uh, and it's a, a lot of it is, is rain that's very fine mist that's actually not picked up by standard rain gauges, but nonetheless falls and plants use. Um, and Anna has some evidence that in fact, when you lose trees, you lose water. And that has all kinds of, uh, as for reasons I've been talking about, if you lose a canopy, things get a lot warmer, right? Uh, uh, particularly uh, in, in the summertime. So we are very interested in putting these observations together and thinking about, because we have a pretty good record of how the forests have changed and forest succession and rebounding after logging, is to put together a model that combines vegetation history and regrowth with our sketchy or spotty, but uh, usable climate records for the region over the last 100 years to ask about those feedbacks between vegetation loss and climate change. Um, so it's a very long answer to say that there's a hint that something like that is going on and, and we'd like to know, we'd like to know more. Jordan, is there anything you wanted to add to that? I don't think so. <laughs> yeah, you, you kind of covered it all. I mean, I think the, the thing that I think about that's related is, is about um, sort of the, the future versions of that with hemlock woolly adelgid and other um, pests and diseases that that might be affecting trees that are there now and then um, having sort of knock on effects on other species by changing the, their local climate. So. And I actually had a note to ask about hemlock loss because I know up here you're driving around and you just see those gray ghosts where in the gullies. Um, have you I'm not sure, Dr. Fridley, in relation to the woolly adelgid moving in, your microclimic sensors being deployed, but do you all have any, any um, data on like before and after hemlock loss and suggestions of how that might impact your models moving forward? Oh, that's a great question. And I, the answer is I wish we did. Uh, when I started was when the first trees were just starting to die. Uh, and of course, a decade later, as you said, it's kind of the standing dead everywhere. Um, and we don't even really have a, a good way to model that yet. Um, we had at one point put in a bunch of loggers in a big hemlock stand uh, to anticipate that, but it was ended up being one of the stands that was protected by the park. There's about 30 places that the park is treated for, for very good reasons. Um, so they didn't die. So uh, it's something that, you know, it's on our list to do. And it's, as Jordan said, it's so critical because the way I think about this whole process is the canopy of the Smokies, the complex, really thick canopy acts as a wet blanket. And so if you're changing room temperature above a wet blanket, not a lot penetrates into what's going on below that wet blanket. 
But if you dry out the blanket, or if you start poking holes in it, as you do with canopy mortality that is accelerating, if anything, in the last decade or so, then all bets are off. And our understanding of what's happened in the past of how the atmosphere affects microclimate may not inform what's going to happen in the future as, as essentially the forest dries and thins out. So that's something we'd, we'd love to get a better understanding of. Thank you. Um, Mark Barrett has a question. Uh, he asks, the temperature data comes from areas where humans disturbance occurred, logging or farming or both. Would you expect the same results in places like Upper Raven Fork that were never logged? Yeah, we a, a good portion of the sensors that we had out of the network were from old growth. Um, you wouldn't know it from the maps because disturbance um, happened at both high and low elevations, a little more common at low elevations. Um, we've never, I mean, it's a great question as to whether or not there's a legacy of forest disturbance that we can see in the climate data today. And you might expect that based on uh, the old growth forests are uh, structurally more complex. They tend to be taller. They tend to be, have more leaves per unit ground area than succeeding forests. And so there's a good reason to think that those old growth forests buffer microclimate a little bit better. On the other hand, a lot of the old growth has hemlock uh, or had hemlock and, and doesn't anymore. So um, it's, it's tough to say. I, I would expect uh, without clear data to say that um, the older the forest, the more the buffering capacity of the forest on microclimate. Thank you. Uh, Karen Patterson is asking, can you expand on your reasons why it is wetter than it used to be? Um, you know, it, it might have to do with, uh, you know, going back to the conversation we just had, it might have to do with the fact that there's more forest there than there was 100 years ago, and it's been gradually aggrading in many areas. Um, mostly, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> um, I should say that the there's reasons to be suspect of the historical weather data that we have, in part because... Um, I guess for good reasons, or at least obvious reasons, there are very few reliable climate records at high elevation. Uh, there's a sensor that was put on Klingman's Dome in the 1960s. Um, there is a, um, if some of you may, who know the Smokies know that there's actually cabins you can rent at the top of Mount LeConte at high elevation. You can take a mule train up to the top and stay in a, a rodent infested cabin for a couple of days. Um, not saying it's not nice. I'm, I've heard it's very lovely, but that place is actually kept. They have a a um, rain gauge and a thermometer up there. And for since the mid 70s, someone would get up in the morning and look at the min max temperature and write it on a calendar. Not every day, but many days. At some point, they put all these calendars in a box and the box made its way down to headquarters in Gatlinburg and a very astute a uh, member of staff said, hey, I think we might have a climate record up at high elevation. Do you want to digitize it? So we did. And that's actually part of the historical record that we have. But that's it. There are no other high elevation records in the Smokies, even though it's a third of the park. So I would take some of that rainfall data with a big grain of salt. And um, it might be getting wetter because the forests are getting thicker, but it's unclear. I know um, precipitation variability was a big thing highlighted in our salamander talk last week. Just it's, it's really hot, wet or it's really dry more and more. Mm -hmm. And I was curious, I noticed on the, the hex scale graphs of micro and macro climates across elevation that I, I was sitting there doing the math on my, on my phone, I have to admit and figuring out where Highland sits relative to the Smokies, because we're in that, that 1,000 to 15,000 meter, 1,000 to 1,500 meter um, range from Cashers down in the valley to Highlands up here. So uh, just for folks who may be watching who weren't doing the mental math, that thick band of green seems to be where we would be in comparison to the Smokies. And I raise that question because Bill Horton is asking, 
what is a rational break point for separating high elevation versus low elevation as far as future climate buffering capacity? Is there a critical level, and he's suggesting perhaps 3,000 feet, or does it need to be over 5,000 feet? Because we're, we're definitely not over 5,000 feet here. Yeah, I'm gonna punt that one to Jordan. Sure. Um, so the way that we think about elevation in um, the models we were making is, is the elevation of specific points. So it's, it's sort of a surface. It's a, a line where you could say that the higher the elevation you, you go, the, the more buffered. But the important thing to think about here in terms of like a break point or where is susceptible and not is that it's really mediated by that other axis on the figures, that exposure axis. So if you're right next to a stream, then um, it's more buffered at a lower elevation, whereas up on a ridge is, is more tightly tied to the atmosphere um, at the same elevation. So I don't think we can give one threshold and it probably also really depends on the plants. So some plants have really narrow um, climate um, suitability, really narrow range of climates that they grow well in and other plants like uh, say red maple, they can grow at like a huge range of elevations and tons of different environmental conditions. So for them, the, the um, difference between, you know, a degree of warming and two degrees of warming might not matter as much as for a Douglas or as for uh, a Fraser fir. Um, do you want to add anything to that? <laughs> Uh, that's uh, pretty much my thoughts. Uh, of course, Jordan has informed my thoughts for the most part, but but yeah, I think the, the the topographic complexity means it's actually difficult to make kind of hard and fast rules about elevation because it depends on where you are in relation to other factors like streams. That is a very valid point. Um, and Caitlin or Winter may have other burning questions. Um, so if you have one, line it up. But I love this question that Karen Patterson has sent in and I've been saving it towards the end. She says, these data could be used to support the argument that climate change is quote, no big deal to biota. How do you counter arguments that could or will be presented by anti-climate change lobbies and public forums that use these data to support their arguments that we don't need to address climate change? Yeah, yeah, great question. I think as scientists, it's just as important to point out cases where climate is not the most pressing concern as it is in the many, many more cases where climate is a huge pressing concern. No one believes someone that's just going to pick one factor and say it's the most important everywhere. So really we we see our role as we ask the question, uh, is, uh, is the climate going to change in a way that organisms that we care about are gonna be strongly affected? In most places of the world, the answer is a resounding yes. In some areas of the world, uh, they're probably gonna be fairly buffered from climate change, at least over the next couple of decades. Of course, it comes with a whole lot of caveats. Um, climate change, is one of the factors that is driving the expansion of invasive insects and diseases across North America. Uh, that is right now today, the largest threat to the integrity of forests across the Eastern United States, along with you know, cutting down trees and putting asphalt on them. So habitat loss. Um, there are a number of other contributing factors. The, the huge expansion of deer populations in many areas is also an incredibly uh, destructive force of the loss of top predators and the cascading effects on plants. Um, and, and climate is sometimes a third, a fourth, a fifth most important concern. That's not to say 100 years from now, the indirect effect of climate in, in killing off so many of our forest giants is not going to totally transform the Smokies. But um, I think my, my general response is, if we do the analysis and we find that there's reasons that the landscape can protect itself against atmospheric change, it's our job to articulate that. Did you want to add to that, Jordan? Uh, I think I would just add, I think um, one of the interesting things in thinking about microclimate in particular in the context of climate change is that it doesn't just 
happen. Some of it is physical, but a lot of it has to do with the plants that are already there. And so I think uh, in doing this kind of work, we can better understand why things might be protected from climate change. And so it's, it's in some ways another way to think about um, land conservation conservation that if we lose this forest canopy that's that's acting as that wet blanket you know if you um, get a hole in it that you're you're changing the climate even more quickly underneath and so thinking about that interaction between um, the sort of global climate change issue and what's what's happening at the stand scale in forests is is also really important all right um, we have one last question from Mark Barrett. He says, is it fair to say your data appear to suggest we might see table mountain pine and scrub pine higher on ridges in the future than we do today? I don't know if Jordan's seen table mountain pine, maybe not. She hasn't done a whole lot of work on, on mid to high elevation ridges. Um, it's a great question. I think given the fact that Table Mountain Pine has evolved to be such an incredible stress tolerator in really exposed locations, I suspect it, it will continue to do so and probably at a higher elevation because it's those ridges that truly are responding to what's going on in the atmosphere. So the, the, the plants and animals that are associated with those ridges, I think are the ones that probably are gonna respond as much as anything uh, to, uh, to the changes that, that we predict. Is, is that what you'd say, Jordan, without knowing the specifics of Table Mountain Pine? Yeah, I haven't, I haven't looked at those species in, that, in the model specifically, so that's- We probably don't have enough plots to model Table Mountain Pine because it's not super common. <laughs> I know there are some pines that came out, but, but I don't think that one. Yeah. All right, well, Thank you both so much. I greatly appreciate it. Um, we're getting some thanks from attendees. And I know that myself and Winter and Caitlin are certainly echoing that. We really appreciate your time. And for those of you who are still with us, thank you so much for joining us. Recordings of this lecture will technology permitting be available on our YouTube channel by next Monday. The last of our climate conversation lectures for this year, and it was a great one to end on, but it's not our final lecture series for the year. If you have heard of our Zoner lecture series, they will be returning. So keep your eye on our website for more information, and you can sign up for our eBlast to stay up to date with all of the changes and announcements. And finally, if you'd like to support the foundation and programming like this, you can become a member or make a donation on our website. We appreciate your support. So. As we wrap up here, my thanks again to Dr. Fridley and Jordan for joining us. We appreciate it and have a wonderful night, everybody. Thank you. Thanks for tuning in.